I'm honored to have been asked to co-chair this important conference on the role of agriculture in meeting health challenges. Can I start by congratulating the International Food Policy Research Institute for launching this global policy consultation. It is a sign of the prestige in which the Institute and its work are held that so many distinguished experts of food on food, farming, and health have traveled to India to take part in these discussions. We have already heard some typically inspiring and challenging thoughts from Prime Minister Fick. Few leaders have such a high reputation at home and abroad. Both India and the international community are fortunate have such courageous, wise, and principled leadership. Dr. Singh, of course, leads a country which stands as an example of development throughout the world. This is both the world's largest democracy and also one of its fastest growing economic powers. In Africa, we look at the progress of India, a valued partner, not with envy, but with hope. We also see in this determination to overcome challenges and to harness the talents of his people a model for us to follow. One of the biggest challenges, of course, is how India can securely and sustainably feed its fast growing population. This is a daunting challenge faced in many parts of the world as well. Ladies and gentlemen, over a billion people throughout the world, the highest number we are told for the past four decades, will go hungry today and every day. Food prices, which are rising sharply, are likely to increase these numbers. And there are many hundreds of millions more who, while not hungry, suffer the damaging impact of consistently poor diets. For these families, there may be food on the table, but they have little choice over what they eat. This failure to provide sufficient and nutritious food has a devastating impact on health and development. This starts in the very earliest days of life the physical and mental development of unborn children is badly damaged, often irreversibly, if their mothers cannot eat properly. Malnutrition stunts our children's growth, increases their vulnerability to disease, reduces their capacity to learn at school. And of course, all this feeds through into the wider economy with poorer productivity and performance. So the challenges you are addressing today at this conference are not just about survival or fairness, but are the heart of hopes for long-term social and economic development. Without the solutions you provide and the commitment from political leaders, this is important, commitment from political leaders to put them into action, our ambitions for a fairer and stable world will not account for much. Ladies and gentlemen, I have seen from, my, from Ghana and from the continent of Africa the scale of the challenge we face and also how working together with science and technology as the major tools, governments, research institutions, private sector, and individual farmers can overcome it. For more than any continent, Africa stands in need of the solutions. This August conference will proffer for tackling the myriad challenges in agriculture, nutrition, and health. Africa alone, of all the world's continents, does not grow enough food to feed itself. This is not because of lack of will or shortage of land. In fact, according to an authoritative recent report, around 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land 
is in Africa. Rather, the devastating food deficits on the continent is largely because of a lack of knowledge, resources, and opportunity. The critical need is for the transformed farmer. Across Africa, farmers are still scratching a living from the land by hand, like our ancestors used to do. Agriculture is back-breaking. There is no joy or reasonable reward in this type of farming to attract the educated youth of today. The revolution which has transformed agriculture around the world, including here in Asia, has largely passed Africa by. The average farmer in Africa has not largely shared in the advances in irrigation or improved crop varieties uh, which have revolutionized yields elsewhere. Our agriculture is overwhelmingly still rain-fed. If the rains fall, if the rains fail, our crops fail. Even if the rains come at the time and intensity expected, our crops are at the mercy of pests and diseases. Poor harvest losses remain heavy. There is little use of pesticides, machinery, or fertilizers. There is hardly any diversification. Together with outdated farming practices, this reduces the fertility of the land. It forces families to move on, slashing and burning causing severe and lasting damage to our environment. The educated youth therefore escape and drift from rural areas into towns in search of non-existent jobs. In Ghana not long ago, virgin forests used to cover 40% of the, of the country. Now, within a space of four decades, it is as little as seven percent. Sadly, our forests are still being felled indiscriminately to meet international demand for wood and timber. We are destroying our precious natural heritage. And yet again, we are exporting raw materials without adding any extra value for our citizens and our posterity. And of course, climate change is making these challenges even worse. Africa is the continent which, going, which is going to be most affected by the impact of man's carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Already, we are seeing the deserts in the north of Ghana creeping down south towards the coast. Extreme weather across Africa is becoming more regular. The rains are becoming more unpredictable. This failure of agriculture forces us to import food from outside our continent, stripping countries of the scarce resources they need for development. But too often, this food itself is of dubious nutritional quality. For example, Chicken passed from Europe, which cannot be sold at home there in Europe. And poor quality rice from Asia are dumped in Africa, forcing down the prices of our homegrown crops. In some, ladies and gentlemen, this is the unhappy story of agriculture in many parts of Africa today. But distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the picture is not all gloomy. For the evidence shows that if our farmers are given the knowledge and resources which their counterparts in other parts of the world take for granted, they can quickly increase yields. I've seen this from my time in government in Ghana on important cash crops like cocoa and in food production generally. And this includes fisheries as well as, as, well as livestock. Ghana is one of the biggest exporters of cocoa in the world, 
indeed the second biggest. But it was always clear that with the right government support and the spread of best practice, yields could be greatly increased. And this is the path my government followed. It adopt, ad adapted the latest knowledge from universities, agricultural institutions, experts, and farmers across the world. The policy was underpinned with access to affordable credits to the farmer. Cocoa farms were sprayed with pesticides free of charge. The government provided fertilizers where they were needed. Importantly, government gave farmers a major incentive to expand production through enabling them to keep a much bigger share of the international export price of the commodity from about 40% in the year 2002 to about 70% in 2004. The result was dramatic. And it was that between the year 2002 and 2005, cocoa production in Ghana doubled per hectare from 350,000 tons in the year 2001 Production jumped to 734,000 tons by the year 2005, an all-time record in the over 100 years of cocoa farming in the country. We successfully used many of the same techniques to improve food uh, production for food crops, such as maize, yams, and plantains as well, and also in livestock, which has always been free-ranging, and uh, also fisheries very traditional, canoe and paddle. Government, for example, established the Grains and Legumes Development Board to supply quality seeds and planting materials to farmers as a strategy to improve the quantity and quality of agricultural produce. The outcome is that despite the problems the nation has faced, especially through 2006, 7, and 8, food is plentiful in Ghana. We have made sure as well that our children gain from this progress and has also caused a monumental increase uh, in enrollment at schools. The government launched an ambitious program to give all kindergarten and primary school peoples a daily hot and nutritious meal made from locally produced food. This is in keeping. This policy is keeping the children in school and has also caused a monumental jump in enrollment. Further, the farmer gets enriched because the food for the children is bought from the local farmer, not imported, whilst uh, the child is also properly nourished. The girl child in particular is saved by this policy from such plights as teenage pregnancy because they remain in school because of the nutritious meal they are expecting. Into motherhood later and with education, she should be more responsible in raising her children with better feeding practices. Already interesting results are showing as more girls than girl, uh, boys are being enrolled in schools uh, in many parts of the country. Government invested too in wider rural development. It is little good increasing yields in the farms if crops cannot be stored safely or transported to markets. So as well as supporting irrigation, improved seeds and crop diversification, government pursued an integrated rural development policy in which it built feeder roads, silos, and coal stores for horticultural crops such as pineapples, mangoes, and bananas, and fisheries. Government also extended mechanization on soft loan terms to the farmers, giving tractors to them uh, on high purchase terms affordably. 
reintroduction of strategically deployed extension services network was given oversight shape in implementing the policy. Rural electrification, upgraded healthcare centers, potable water supply, and quality uh, schools are integral to this policy of improving agriculture. By this policy, government ex sub extended support to six out of every 10 of Ghanaian's population that still live in the rural communities and help to slow down the increasing drift of the youth into our towns and cities. A further plank of this policy has been the introduction of the youth in agricultural program, by which special measures are targeted at the educated youth to entice them to remain in farming. Happily, similar progress is being achieved in many parts of Africa today. But there is so much more that could be achieved with the help of international institutions such as IFPRI. Technical and financial assistance must be extended openly and generously to the countries which can most benefit. Thus, capacity development in beneficiary countries must be identified as priority. The objective must be for international bodies such as IFPRI to work together in partnership with research institutes and scientists of recipient states to focus on their peculiar agricultural problems. The role of IFRI is absolutely critical here in helping agriculture in less developed countries, particularly in Africa, to become more productive, to effect posit positively on the nutrition and health of these countries. This requires that IFPRI commits to sustained and purposeful advocacy to ensure that farmers and communities benefit from the breakthroughs made in research and development. In this era of the all-pervasive information and communications technology, this should be achievable. To achieve all these goals, IFPRI and its partners have to help individual governments put their research outcomes at the heart of integrated national policy programs. There must also be collaboration with important continental and regional groups, such as the New Partnership for Africa's Development, the Southern African Development Community, and the Economic Community of West African States. Distinguished colleagues, there is no more basic need than the food man eats. It decides not just the health of individuals, but also the health of communities. Yet it is because of shortages of nutritious food that millions of our fellow human beings are condemned to far shorter lives than those in more food secure countries. In the 21st century, this is a scandal which must shame all of us. The forces of globalization, if they are to be seen throughout as benign, must be harnessed to tackle this most basic of inequalities. And ladies and gentlemen, it becomes obvious that to leverage agriculture means above all transforming the farmer who must be educable and empowered by society to maximize quality food output using scientific and technological means. Properly rewarded by rational social market policies, farming should be the occupation of choice for the modern day youth. A healthy and happy future for mankind needs such a farmer. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be with you today. There is, I believe, no more important gathering in our world today than conference such as ours today. So I wish you all well in our discussions. Thank you. Thank you.